Welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kazaska. Hey, Ben. Hey, Brian. It's been a couple weeks. We're back, and we have a fantastic interview with Tony Krantz. This is pretty awesome. I mean, what I love about this interview is that we just get a little bit of history of Twin Peaks. I mean, there's there's some really cool history going on that only I feel Tony can share with us. So, I mean, it's so cool, and I can't wait for everybody to hear it. agent of Mark Frost and David Lynch and you got them together. Can you share with us that story? So the basic story is is that David and Mark had worked together on a movie called Goddess or Mm. The Goddess. It was the Marilyn Monroe movie. And um, it was a script that was being produced by a guy named Bernie Schwartz who was a producer who um, did Coal Miner's Daughter among other things. So David Mm. and Mark had a relationship. Uh, meanwhile, I'm in the television packaging department at CAA. David's a client. I'm representing him. And um, I, I forget exactly what it was, but David and I um, would go to Nibbler's, this mm-hmm. restaurant on Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills, all the time. We'd go to do bars and Nibbler's, places that he liked. And I wanted to get David into television because that was the world that I worked in principally. Hmm. And I said to him, you know, this world of nibblers is sort of the world you should write about, the world of regular people. Hmm. And um, I honestly don't remember how I first met Mark Frost, but Mark was also a client had come out of Hill Street Blues. So this idea of David and Mark together, this sort of, you know, yin and yang of the two of them was the perfect idea. And I screened for the guys, Peyton Place, the movie. Mm. Um, And I said, this is sort of, you know, further the Nibblers thing. This is what you guys should do. This was after a aborted attempt at doing a show for NBC called The Lemurians Mm. that was based on um, the Isle of Lemuria, which is considered the lost continent of Lemuria, like Atlantis. Uh We pitched it to Brandon Tartikoff, who was running NBC at the time, and Brandon ordered it as a movie, wanted to do it as a movie, but David didn't want to do it as a movie, just wanted to do it as a series, so it fell apart. And then the discussions about what to do, what to do, and that's where Peyton Place came in, and um, it was off of that that the guys created an idea called Northwest Passage. Mm. And um, I took them in to uh, Chad Hoffman, who was the drama executive at ABC. I was covering ABC at the time, and Chad basically bought it in the room. David unfurled the um, the map to Twin Peaks, which he then subsequently gave me one year for my birthday, and wow. described what the world would be like and this and that, and, and uh, Chad ordered it as a script. When the title, Northwest Passage didn't clear, we we then went to the fallback, which was Twin Peaks. So that's sort of what happened. Wow, that's so cool. How did you see the relationship? Did you get did you stay in touch with them as they were making the first season, as they were working on the second season? Were you getting to see how that relationship was working? Well, I was very involved uh, with the guys, intimately involved. Mm-hmm. I was both their agent. I was sort of the... I don't know if I would say that I was the, sort of the, the business guy behind the show, but in many ways I was. I was the person who, you know, would be dealing with them every single day and representing Lynch Frost and, and all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also started representing David in the movie business. And I think that um, the rise of Twin Peaks and the sort of the canonizing of David as America's newest genius, the Time Magazine cover, all those things, yeah. created a fracture, a fracture in the relationship between Mark and David. It was seen as David Lynch's Twin mm. Peaks. And Mark was doing a lot of the work, you know, with the scripts and all that stuff. I, <clears throat> I think was feeling a bit marginalized. After the first season, the show got 
I don't know, 16 Emmy nominations or some incredible wow. number like that. Yeah. Um, the guys were, were barely talking to each other. Um, David was off about to begin Wild at Heart, which I put together as a movie. He ended up winning the Palm Door for it at Cannes. I went to Cannes with David when he got the award. Wow. And I remember going to a restaurant. It was called Muse, M-U-S-E. It was a restaurant that David Mark and I would go to all the time at night where David and I would just go by ourselves. Um, David was one of my dearest friends. We had Thanksgiving together. We were very, very close uh, mm. in those days. And I remember the three of us having dinner at Muse, and I said, you know, you guys are much stronger together than you are apart. The success that you've had has been, you know, legion. Um, we need you guys to grasp hands and work together. Um, and that's really the secret of the relationship. And I remember literally grabbing both their hands and having them hold each other's uh -huh. hand across the table. Wow. But the problem was is that David's movie career was was – growing and the need for second season was at hand and David got, I mean, Mark sort of took over the show in the second year. David was not really available to do any directing mm -hmm. and there was a writing staff um, that Mark hired that tried to essentially mimic the idiosyncrasies of David uh, in the second season mm -hmm. and it became like this Russian novel of character after character sprawling out in a sort of, you know, um, unending way. And all the core characters were never really dealt with. Mm. There were no storylines interweaving the series regulars. It was always about what we can do that's new and where we can take the story. And there was frankly a lack of um, discipline as related to uh, the storytelling. Meanwhile, the, uh, the clarion call by ABC is to who killed Laura Palmer came and they wanted to figure that out and to resolve it. And David and Mark were adamant that the minute that you resolve who killed Laura Palmer, the series is over. Mm. And they were a hundred percent right about that. It's interesting. Bob Iger's uh, autobiography that just came out, he actually reflects on that debate. And uh, he, he sort of says that David may have been right, wow. that it was never meant that the murder of Laura Palmer would overtake the series, the country, popular imagination, the way that it did, it was always supposed to be sort of an inciting incident, the murder of Laura Palmer, but not the re raison d'etre for the series as to who the killer was. Hmm. So, you know, as the show became less and less interesting from a story point of view and more and more sort of quirky for quirky sake, people started abandoning it. It was also given a very bad time period on the Saturday night when core fans would not be home. Yeah. This was before VCRs and people taping shows, so there was no live plus three, live plus seven, any of that stuff. And so the show sort of faded, um, and it had to do with the David being uh, absentee, Mark and his writers sort of trying to create a faux David Lynch, and uh, you know, who killed Laura Palmer thing, becoming uh, overwhelming in terms of the need to solve it. I, you know, going through, you know, I've been doing research and going through the, at least the first season, it seems like David Lynch w had a lot of say on the directors and it was Mark Frost who seemed to bring the writers. I mean, there's some of the directors were part of AF's, AFI and it seems like, at least it seems like how they both contributed, at least from what I look at, it looks like that some of their contributions was David on the directors, Mark Frost on the writers. Well, maybe. I think that that would be um, cursory hmm. to say that. I think that, you know, it was it was really more, you know, David's genius. You know, when you look at um, Francis, a Francis Bacon hmm. painting, right, you look at that and you say, oh, my God, it's so incredible. It's so unusual. It's it's something that nobody other than Francis Bacon could come up with. Yeah. So that was his contribution, things like the log lady and, and things that were so unusual and different. Um, the second season tried to be tried to be Francis Bacon, but it wasn't Francis Bacon. I wouldn't say it was Leroy Neiman, but mm. you get the point. Yes. That it was a more um, it was a fake David Lynch. And, you know, whether or not the audience understands it or not, they can sense it and feel it. 
and David was just unavailable. He was off directing movies. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the other thing, which I think is, you know, you look at a show like Succession, right? I don't know if you guys have been watching that show, which I think is masterful. I actually haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it either. Oh, it's <laughs> maybe the best show on TV. Wow. And the the thing about Succession is that you're really dealing with all the core characters, the sort of faux Rupert Murdoch family. And you keep dealing with them again and again and again and again, and you fall in love with the characters, and you can't wait to see what's next. And you tune into the next episode as a result. There was no interest that was created from a story point of view where people just got, you know, fed up with it. It's like quirky and weird, and I don't even know who this character is, and what Mm. about the people that I came to know and love, and all of those people sort of disappeared. So, um, you know, that it was basic storytelling 101 Mm. that was missed, and it's frankly harder to write stories about um, your core characters because you've got to interweave them and it's complicated yeah. and you know you've got to work it through it's easier to just forget about them and just write new new stuff mm-hmm. and that was I think the biggest reason why the show failed that's a great great point I yeah. didn't really thought of it like that I guess I did think about the characters weren't there as much but I didn't ever thought it was harder to write for the actual characters you had that's interesting mentioned how David Lynch was busy. It seems like Mark Frost was busy as well. That there was a show called American Chronicles on Fox that he was helping produce, and then he also seemed to be doing pre-production for Storyville. And he actually then did, and I think maybe in the spring or when the, when the show actually ended, he actually filmed it. But it seems like they were both really busy, and you wonder if both Mark Frost and David Lynch being busy, that maybe Harley Payton and other people were kind of taking over for a, a period of time, and if that hurt the show. Well. It's possible. Harley um, is not a, uh, he's very, very um, facile and very verbal. But when it comes to doing the work and doing the hard work of churning story that with characters that you love, it isn't something that he excels at, in my mind. I've mm. had a lot of experience with Harley. I used to represent him. I was his agent wow. during this period. He's worked for me in a couple of shows. And um, um, I think that that is an accurate uh, overview of Har- Harley. As it relates to Mark, I think that Mark was there uh, in the second season. I think it was yeah. really the Mark and Harley show in many regards. And mm. I think that the two of them were very dear friends, and one of them had an idea, they just went with it. And I really do think it was a, uh, a failure of basic storytelling 101, where you disregard the core characters that are the series regulars. And you just create, you know, uh, one-eyed jacks and all these crazy things mm. that um, nobody really uh, had any connection to. You're interested in the characters that are the series regulars, mm. and they didn't tell stories about them. Yeah. And it is much more difficult because it's like a, you know, it's a clockwork to tell the stories about them. It's like, where do they go? How do they work? There were many, many characters that were probably too many to deal with Hmm. um you know and the core idea of you know it's this investigation and this murder and where does dale cooper go and what's happening with him and a love story for him or there were basic things that they just didn't really do because Hmm. they weren't interested in conventional storytelling and it was the kind of thing where they were the you know the chosen People, they were the the gods of TV. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. Yeah, it was the weirdest and quirkiest and most, you know, widely praised show. It was it, and so you know they won the Golden Globe and they were all mm. the Emmy nominations and all these different things. So to say to them, guys, you've got to go back to basics, mm. wasn't something that they were necessarily going to do. So 20 years ago, you worked on Mahalan Drive, the TV show, the pilot and stuff. And 
And before that, there, were, there had been rumors like 1990-91 that, that Audrey Horn was going to have a spinoff, and that was going to be called Mulholland Drive. Do you remember anything about the, the Audrey Horn spinoff? Yeah. So what, what it was going to be, I had this very novel idea to mix movies and television. Had Twin Peaks succeeded, what would have happened, what our plan was, was that there would be a cliffhanger at the end of, the, of season two, hmm. which would be an Audrey Horn cliffhanger, which would then tell the story of Audrey's uh, arrival in Hollywood, a story around Hollywood for her. That would be a movie that David would direct that would come out in the summer between the second and third season of Twin Peaks. Wow. And then Mulholland Drive would spin off into its own series in the third year as the Hollywood story of Audrey Horn. That was the plan. And I had come up with this crazy scheme of mixing movies and TV, given the fact that David was a movie director and that we had this sort of ability. But when Twin Peaks failed in the second season, all of that went out the window. But the idea of a Hollywood story with David was something that I always wanted to do. I mm -hmm. love the idea of, of Audrey Horn and Mulholland Drive and all that stuff. So it took me 10 years to convince David to do it after the demise of Twin Peaks because he was so hurt by the demise of Twin Peaks. He didn't want to go into TV, and he blamed the medium rather than uh, the show. So I finally got him to do it. I remember it very, very well. He and I were the producers of it. I tried to find a replacement, Mark Frost, for him. David wasn't having it. It was a woman named Joyce Elias, and it was a writer. Um, and instead, David and I went in and pitched Mulholland and Drive, where I basically read it hmm. as his producing partner, as the chairman of Imagine. I read a two-page thing that he wrote. David sat there mute in the meeting at ABC. And uh, Stu Bloomberg and Jamie Tarsus nevertheless committed right there on the spot. Wow. Hmm. David turned in the script. They ordered it to production. David turned in a two-and-a-half-hour pilot hmm. for a two-hour uh, time slot. It, it was 90, it was 30 minutes too long. Okay. The cut. ABC hated it. Uh. They did not like it. They thought it was slow. They didn't like any of it. They thought it was weird. It wasn't what they were hoping for. It was wrong in every direction for them. And they gave David, you know, a lot of notes. Um, I knew that this was going to be problematic. I drove up to David's house and brought two bottles of his favorite red wine mm -hmm. called Lynch Bage to sort of... Um, talked through the notes, and about three hours later, we were back to the first note. David could not understand why ABC didn't like it, and he wanted to have the last 30 minutes, the th first 30 minutes of the next episode. Sort of a reasonable idea, but I said to him, if we do that, we'll never, you know, work at ABC again. It's their $7 million. They want it to be tighter and faster and better. So David did all the notes, and um, <clears throat> ABC passed on it nevertheless. Yeah. David was heartbroken. And then uh, we made it as a uh, movie with Ganel Plus, and the rest is history. But it was the end of David's uh, experience in TV, and, you know, um, uh, that's what it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's something. And it's funny, you know, on so many lists now, that movie is like the best film of the 21st century. I mean, right. it's still considered right, yeah. one of the greatest ever. I mean, and half of it is the pilot. Yeah. Really. I mean, like, so it's like, <laughs> he did a great pilot, and you guys did great. I mean, yeah, wow. more than half of it. I'd yeah. say about 75% of, wow. of it is the 80% of it. You know, and it's, um, it's an unusual pilot. Uh, it's got a different pace, and this was also in a different era of network TV, whether or not it would have worked in the cable or streaming space now, who knows. Mm. But, you know, you saw the most avant-garde version of Twin Peaks, which I guess you're calling season three, um, you know, which was completely uh, its own thing. And, um, you know, as avant-garde and different as you could get, I saw very little of it, frankly. I was not involved because... You know, it was uh, it, it was David's thing, and so you know, and I was the agent mm. on Twin Peaks. I wasn't their executive producing partner, even though I functioned really as their third partner yeah. on the show. Yeah, and uh, there's also a rumor of like Albert Rosenfield ha was going to have a spinoff. Did he, do you know anything about that? No, that, my, Albert my, Rosenfield. Uh, so Miguel Ferreira, he was a. Uh, 
he was a FBI agent. Like he was the forensic FBI agent, and there was rumors that he I'm, he was going to get a spinoff back in ninety ninety one. No. Okay. No, there was no truth to that. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. And Fire Walk with Me, were you involved with the with the film? I mean, that was such a quick turnaround. The 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 movie. I mean, the TV show was canceled, and like a year later, the film came out. You know, I was very involved. I was the guy who put together the deals. I represented Bob Engels. David mm. looked at as his new Mark Frost. Bob was a very good guy, and Mark and David could work with him in a way that he couldn't with Mark. <clears throat> his relationship with Mark had come to an end mm. <clears throat> over the sort of jealousy and issues like that. Mm. And Bob was much more compliant and uh, <clears throat> David uh, made the movie with him, and I think it was financed by the, the French Pierre yeah. Edelman, I think, was mm -hmm. one of the producers. And yeah. I was very involved in that. I put the whole thing together, and you know that was uh, something I was, you know, I was the agent for everybody. Yeah, it seemed like at the beginning of when they were working on Firewalk with Me, like uh, Mark Frost, I've seen things where he was like, "Oh, it's going to be the next Star Trek franchise. It's going to be movies," and it seemed like he was gung ho about doing Twin Peaks movies, and then something just fell apart. And I, I mean, he says he didn't want to do prequels and stuff that they wanted to do go forward, but clear their relationship must have broke down. But the thing about David is that David is like Francis Bacon. Hmm. He is a painter. You know, he does not love the confines of television storytelling and the requirements, you know, 44 minutes and 38 seconds, whatever it is, each episode. So, you know, you see the result of that in Twin Peaks season three, which originally started, I think, as 12 episodes or something like that. And yeah, like David, you know, made it into 18. The minute you do that, you know, you can pretty much know that you're throwing out structure and rigor as it relates to beginnings and middles and ends of episodes, because that's no longer what you're doing. Mm. You're, you're maybe getting there to some degree, but you're not delivering in the way that an episode of The Sopranos delivers or mm. Wire or, you know, or Succession, because it's just, you know, you're just expanding it, you're making it longer and what was a three-act structure is now sort of shapeless form. Hmm. And for David, who is Francis Bacon, that makes sense. Each episode is a painting. Hmm. But for an audience that is used to either subtextually or, or overtly looking at things in a three-act way, you know, uh, or whatever that might be, it becomes avant-garde. And avant-garde is less popular. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it was the it was the it was the blend of the two things that David and Mark did perfectly in the first year, but then it's like the Beatles they broke up and success went to their head and uh, Mark couldn't be with it and he brought in Harley Pate <laughs> and there you go. Yeah. Wow, that's really insightful though, Tony. Thank you for this. Thank you for taking the time to to share this with us. You're welcome. You know, it was it was a remarkable thing. It was a beautiful thing. As David would say, mm -hmm. you know, it was a rocket ship that rose super duper high and came crashing down in many ways just as quickly. And the demise of Twin Peaks is a bit of a cautionary tale about needing to not make the form conform to you, but, you know, you working within the form of a show that needs to give a mass audience mm -hmm. a satisfying episode. And it doesn't mean you have to dumb it down. It's not about that at all. You look at a show like Succession, it is anything but dumb. It's brilliantly, brilliantly done. And they were close, you know, but they, they didn't, um, you know, there was, they were also the first, you know, uh, Brandon Tartikoff famously said about the pilot after he saw it, he said that Dryden Drew is dead and buried. You know, it was the most, it was the first time a movie person like David had worked in television. And this was in a world before the Fox network. Yeah. You know, it was three networks. It was crazy that this existed on broadcast. And it was rather because I was the guy who put it together and covered ABC. And Chad Hoffman was the guy who was my counterpart at ABC. 
and he loved David as much as I did. Mm. So he saw it. He saw the potential. And then when the pilot was made, it was undeniable, and the pilot script was undeniable. And, you know, they, they ordered it only for mid-season, for six or seven additional episodes. Yeah. And what the the show benefited from that, because it was being screened everywhere, and the word of mouth started building, building, and building, and building. And when the show went on the air, initially, for the, the last half hour of it, I think it's something like a 39 share. Wow. And that was in a different world than than the world we exist in now. But what that means is that 39% of all televisions that were in use in America in the last half hour of the pilot of Twin Peaks were watching that show. It was a massive audience. Wow. And, you know, that's what uh, fueled it and all that. It became a phenomenon. And if you were to do it again, you would make better episodes because I'm a believer that good episodes, wherever they are, uh, um, stand the test of time. But by virtue of the fact that David and Mark were like the Beatles that broke up, um, and that Mark we started working with Harley and, and writers that, that um, wanted to make their own mark and were not uh, in a partnership with David and his genius. And that And that even further, they weren't willing to conform to the basic rules of storytelling, that the whole thing just, you know, fell out of their um, control. It doesn't mean the way that those episodes were bad, they're interesting, yeah. but it means that the show didn't succeed, and it didn't succeed beyond the cult status that it, that it uh, enjoyed, and um, <clears throat> it, was, it was interesting because it tells you what to avoid and uh, how, to, how to not do that. Yeah, it was interesting that ABC only gave them like seven episodes for the first season. I mean, that's kind of like the model of today. We have like, the UK was doing it for a while, six episodes, and now we do a lot of shows with ten episodes. And you do wonder if the show would have done better to do seven episode seasons and do seven for the second season, and if that would have been wiser for, for this type of a show. I, I don't know about that. I don't think so. I oh. think that um, that was an era where shows were 22 episodes, yeah. shows like Dallas and Dynasty were the number one shows in America being done for 22 episodes. It's just a question of whether or not you've got the story that, uh, that's, that's good enough. That's a good point. Yeah. And there was definitely the story that was good enough. The issue, the, the sort of the T-boning of the show was the desire by ABC to reveal who killed Laurel Palmer. So it was like that became, it was like you were just, were, the show was T-boned in the middle of, the, the middle of it by that. And then it was these other things that I was talking about. You know, but it, it would be a mistake to dwell on the negativity of the demise of Twin Peaks. It is much more interesting to talk about the fact that it was the first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was the first, and it was David Lynch, who is an American treasure, coming in and doing something that was so interesting. Um, and, you know, all the shows that we see now are not... Um, necessarily a result of Twin Peaks, but Twin Peaks was the first. And then there were many other shows that became slowly a result of Twin Peaks, but with cable and streaming, you know, it's the nature of the beast now, and it's it's really a great time to be looking at TV because it is so interesting. It really is. Mm-hmm. It's the best. Thank you, Tony Krantz, for being part of our book, Twin Peaks Unwrap the Book, which you can get now at bluerosemag.com. He was an awesome interview. He tells it like it is. He's an interesting character. And it's just, it blows you away, all the information we got from him. I mean, just the history of him and Mark and Lynch and Twin Peaks. And I don't know. I think if you like this interview, if you really enjoyed listening to this interview, I think you'd really love our book, Twin Peaks Unwrapped the book because it's there's some more of this type of stuff there's more history that of of twin peaks that is just so cool but yeah this was, a, it was this was awesome i love how the whole david lynch giving the map to him yeah to talk to there and that he's framed it and he still has it in his office today i mean he actually we actually got a picture of it and i believe it's in our book and that is just so cool to have that history still you know be out there yeah so the map cool of the, town, the map of twin peaks town 
But thank you everybody who has supported us and thank you for everybody who will purchase the book down the road. No better time. Also, there's a lot of combo packs. You can get other Twin Peaks related books with ours. Yeah, you could get the three pack with Bushman's Conversations with Mark Frost and Laura's Ghost, or there's two packs. I mean, that's really cool. I mean, you save so much on shipping and and and, and these are all great books. I mean. Totally. So. Get that now. We thank everybody for listening to today's show. We'll be back hopefully in a couple weeks with either another interview or our first community rewatch of 2021. Can't wait. Yes. So give us an email at twinpeaksunwrapped at gmail.com. If you would like to be part of the community rewatches, give us an email and in the header put community rewatch part and Ben will get back to you because we'd like to open this up to the community for the, the rest of the, the remaining episodes we're going to be doing. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, give us that five-star review on iTunes, and we will be back in a couple weeks. See you soon.